Tonight, we're going back into the word of God, and we're going to pick up again in the book of Ecclesiastes. And in looking in Ecclesiastes, the subject matter that we're going to deal with tonight is, are we preparing ourselves to rule? Are we preparing ourselves to rule and reign with the Messiah? You see, I have a set of books. I have one hard cup, cover copy, and then I have a couple of paperbacks. And the book talks about the Negro problem. The author of the book is Gunnar Myrdal. Many people can look at him and they can look at a video called Ma'afa, M-A-A-F-F-A, Ma'afa. It's a Swahili word and it talks about the different things that happen when a people are under bondage, but I don't wanna teach the video. You can message me or I can put it up on my Facebook or I allude to it on my YouTube channel. Now, when I talk about this, and when I make you understand about are we ready to grow up? Are we ready to be mature? The one thing that was set up when genocide was set up against we as a people in America, as we, I'm talking right now when I say in America, I'm talking about native black Americans. The reason I don't say African Americans is that we are native to this land. We, I'm talking about the descendants of the enslaved people for over 500 years. We are native to this land. We are not native to Africa. Some of our ancestors were. Some of our ancestors actually lived in Canaan. Some of our ancestors lived in different parts of the world and that what we talk about in the Bible. But we were born here. We were bred here. They actually took our son, put a paper sack on their head after 1808 and would not allow them to see that they were actually having ungodly sex with their mother because of the fact the master, he needed to have more slaves and him wanting to have more slaves, he did that. He also took people and took them from farm to farm, locked them in there in the barn with some of the women and they bred and made slaves. Why are you saying this then? One of the things that happened is after the Emancipation Proclamation, after the Civil War, and it got to be the fact that people were now seeing that the handwriting is on the wall after what is called Jim Crow. See, if you don't know history, Tim, I thought you were teaching the Bible. Well, I need you to understand that the Messiah used the same thing in history to teach people. Let me tell you what the Messiah said one time. I guess you suppose that those people under the pool of Siloam were more wicked than the other people. He said, but except you repent, you shall in likewise perish. So what I need you to be able to undersee as we go through the word of God is this. The Negro problem was there are going to be another 4 million Black native people cut loose on the society. We have kept them from reading under our different laws that we have set up called anti-literacy laws. Now we don't, they don't know how to do anything but farm. We've made all that we could up of them farming after the, farming the rice, the tobacco, the indigo, the cotton. We have worked them from sun to sun and sometime after sun. We don't need them anymore. And now what is going to be said is they're going to drain the society. They're going to need our help. We're going to need our food. And listen, this is where the message comes from. We are the elite. We dress in petticoats. We have the nice luxurious clothes where we have the big plantation houses that we live in. We have our chariots. We have everything that we need, and, uh, and it gets to the place where we even have cars now. And what we got to do is get rid of the Negroes because they're going to be making Uncle Sam or the tax to take care of them, help them have houses, give them schooling. They got to have clothing. They got to need, they're going to need everything. And the Negro is an inferior race. This is what was taught. 
This is what was taught by Blumenbach, Carl, and Carl von Linnaeus, and Johannes Blumenbach. It's throughout all oh, God knows how many books where we were taught that we were inferior, as well as Charles Darwin's in his book, The Descent of Man. I didn't say Origin of the Species. I own both. He said we were inferior. That the Negro left alone would become savage and he would end up dying. That didn't happen. So what they did is they decided we would do something different to help the Negro die off. We won't give him any assistance at all and see he would die off. He didn't die off. Then we decided that we could sterilize them by force. Don't tell me I'm lying. Please don't be that ignorant. We sterilized them. And they made laws. President Nixon was even in on it. Yes, he was. And they had a thing called the Eugenics Board. And they got together with Margaret Sanger. They did the Planned Parenthood. Tim, you're talking about Roe versus Wade. That's a God damnable lie. Wasn't no Roe, wasn't no Wade. This was the thing is we got to get rid of the Negro problem. It's about an 18, 1500 page book called The American Dilemma, Gunner Myrdal. And the premises was that black people are inferior, they're imbeciles, they're unable to learn, things are wrong with their nose, with their head, et cetera, and we got to be the ones in charge. Now, what I want you to do is see this. Are we ready to lead now? Those that have led us, those that have made our laws, made, not only made us inferior and killed our children in the womb, one of them said the best time to kill one is before he's ever born. The best way to wipe them out as a race is don't even let them breed. We've got all we want from them, just like a man goes and treats a whore. He gets what he wants and he's gone. This is like some of us do God too, right? You know, like, Lord, I need you. Lord, you know, we ain't talked in a long time, Lord. You know, like, I sure, I sure would like to spend a little bit of time. I, I got a little need right there, Lord. And I, 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 Lord, I know you can fix it. Can, can I just stop by for a minute and get, what, and get, get something? You know, we're going to be together. And you get maybe healed. You get the job. You pass the grade. And the Lord call you. Whenever you're doing something, you shouldn't tell you to stop. I can't hear you. Or the Lord try to get you to go do some work and stand up for right and not go along with the wrong with the crowd. And I can't hear you. Same thing. Same thing when a man don't answer the call. Woman keep calling, keep calling. Or a man keep calling the woman. Or, or irrespective, you, you get the point. Like I used to say, God's not up for booty calls. But here's the, here's the message. The Messiah's kingdom it's supposed to be done in justice and peace. The Messiah's kingdom is supposed to spread to the end of the earth. And those of us who walk with him, we are supposed to be a priesthood, a royal priesthood unto God. And the priesthood that God gave Israel was for the whole world. As a matter of fact, the Messiah said, we are the light of the world. We were told we were the imbeciles of the world. They said that we were unfit in the world. They said we were feeble-minded. That's why you could kill us. That's why, because what they did is they humanized us and made their conscience feel better. And when I say they, I'm talking about the majority in control. There were many white people, hear me say this one time. There were many white people that didn't go along with the program and fought against it. There were many of them that were against it and tried to fight against it, and they thought it would cost them their life. It would cost them their property, and they buckled, and they bent, and they went along with it, just like many of our politicians buckled, and they bent, and they bent, just like Jesse Jackson said years ago, it was genocide to kill our babies in the womb, to put the eugenic stains out their good genes, Francis Galton, I own that book as well, put that out in the neighborhood to kill our babies. And when he ran for president, they gave him money and he changed and said, well, it's a good thing to do. Are we ready to lead? Are we ready to lead? Are we ready to grow? Now let's open up, let's open up our text. And when I say text, let's open up our Bible so that we can see how our Bible show that the things that Solomon said before, that have happened before, they have happened before, not only have they happened, they're going to happen again. 
nothing new. And he used the illustration of the sun on his circuit, the water on his circuit. And I'm going to submit to you that the way that people lead on this in his circuit. So let's go to first Kings. I guess sometimes people probably get tired of me going to it, but I don't I don't care enough not to do it. Because when you're making a point where I'm making an argument, I'm arguing a case, I'm laying down my, I'm laying down my supports, how I get the analysis of the scripture, what it is, and make sure that it aligns with what it's supposed to with line upon line, precept upon precept. Now, let me give you, try to give it to you in one minute. David had been made the king because a man that was supposed to be lead, he was a child when it came to judgment. He was wicked. He was outside of God's will. And he determined for himself that I can do what I want to do as king. I can change the rules of the most high. And when the most high asked me, can I say ask? Let's don't say ask. When the most high God told me to execute his judgment on a wicked man that had attacked his people, he told me that Amalek had attacked you all. Amalek is one of the descendants of Esau and their king now who wasn't the king then, but the most high God said the whole nation has to pay for what they did. Judgment has to be done. And he gave Saul that job and Saul determined I'm going to mitigate. I'm going to ease some of the punishment. I'll let some of them die, but I'll take a ransom. There is no ransom when the most high God said a death penalty is supposed to be had. The death penalty was supposed to be. The word that was used was charim. Sometimes you might see it in some Bibles and it might say H-E-R-E-M, but it's going to be charim. And he didn't execute God's judgment. And Samuel asked about it. And he said, did you destroy them like I said? Because I had promised they'd be destroyed. He said, well, well, well you know, the people... Oh, that people determined that, that they shouldn't be destroyed. And we kept some of the good stuff and we're going to make sacrifices with it. And Samuel told him, does God have more pleasure in sacrifice than obedience? I'm quoting from 1 Samuel 15 and 23. I'm quoting from 1 Samuel 15 and 23. He says, obedience is better than to sacrifice. Doing what I say is better than offering me all the rams the bulls, the ghosts, or whatever. And to hearken to me uh, uh, is better than all of the other stuff that you could give me. But the point that he was given is this. Obedience is better than sacrifice, but rebellion is equal to witchcraft. You're trying to get what you want through your own methodology and you ignore mine. And he says, stubbornness is as iniquity or lawlessness and idolatry. So the Most High God ripped the kingdom from him you can go look at 1 Samuel 15, and you can see it. There was a prophet crying for Saul, praying for Saul, and God told him to get up. Pray for him no more. And God replaced him with a shepherd, a young man named David. David's job was to execute God's judgment on the earth and lead his people to the place where they would do what God had for them to do when they came out of Egypt. They were supposed to go and heavenize the world, make the world know who Yahweh Elohim was, and to make sure that they executed the judgment that he wanted done and to bring the strangers in and to teach the ones that would be in party or in league with them because they bowed down to God who he was, so that the blessing of Abraham, I didn't say money, the blessing of Abraham that all nations of the earth will be blessed through him, through his seed. You can become his seed biologically by being born. You can become his seed by having the faith that Abraham had in the most high God, and that's what it was to be. Now, by the time we get to Solomon, which is David's son, David has shown himself to be unworthy to judge. David has shown himself, whereas Solomon spared Agag, David would not spare Uriah's wife. He allowed this woman to fulfill the hunger, the desire that was in his loins. I, I, I can imagine she must have been a good looking woman. I can imagine he already had wives. I can imagine she feels like she would be able to satisfy all of his fancies. But what will you give in exchange for your soul? What will you give? 
Do you not think that the Satan that has been doing stuff all these years know what your weaknesses are? Do you think that he doesn't know that you like the praise of men whether, more than the, than the honor that comes from God, that you want to please men and political correctness and whatever church you grew up in and what they say more than what God says when it contradicts it? So don't look at David so hard. Like, I would never do that. Many of us are already guilty of doing the same thing David did. We might not have killed the husband, but we sure did help kill the relationship. So Solomon, seeing that his daddy had executed judgment in the wrong way, did not protect his own daughter, did not protect his daughters or his wife because he had turned from God and now he's made king and listen to his prayer and understand where we're going because I want us to understand. I want you to look at this as being us. All this history I'm giving you, you could call it good literature and good stories, but when I give you the narrative of the Most High God on it, then understand it's theological. And once you understand it's theological, Malachi 3 and 6 says, God does not change. Therefore, I need you to understand it's applicable to us. And look at what the Bible says. I'm going to 1 Kings chapter 3. I don't know why I have an 8 up there. I probably thought the wrong thing in my mind, but I'll get over it. 1 Kings chapter 3. The Bible says, I don't want, I want 1 Kings 3 and 8. Let's try that. All right. Look at what the Bible says here. Solomon says, Let's look at, let's say six. And the reason I'm doing this is I want to cut time, but at the same time, I need if somebody go and repeat something that I said, they don't care if Tim said it. They don't care if I live or die. So this is what I'm doing. I'm throwing it back on the word of God so that you will see where my ultimacy of the authority of what I'm saying comes from. And if you disagree, we can agree with the most high. So Entering into the background history I gave you and Solomon may go be put king. This is what Solomon says in um, three and five. In Gibeon, Yahweh appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and Elohim, that's why I'm saying Elohim. There it is right there. Elohim said, ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, you have showed unto David, my father, great mercy according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness. He didn't mention the wickedness, see? He's asking that God would judge him on the truth and righteousness and the sins that David had done. Would you not hold him accountable, accountable for that? Because he came to you. He did the Psalm 51. He acknowledged, not only acknowledged his sin, he never went back and did that again. And so the Lord, he's asking the Lord to put that in the sea of forgetfulness or cast it into the sea or not bring it up again. When you talk about God, don't remember, don't act like he doesn't remember. Solomon is asking that he does it according. That's a qualifier. So do it according as he has walked before thee in truth and in righteousness. Another word for righteousness is justice. See that word, sedaka? Sedaka? Look over here on the right hand corner of those that's looking with me. Sedaka means honesty, justice, justness, and we could go on in the same vein, okay? You can't be righteous without being just. That's why they call John the Baptist a just man and a holy. And it says, as he walked before thee in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Where, where was that? Because I want you to see, there it is, this day. Verse seven, and now, O Yahweh, my Elohim, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father. And I am but a child. He didn't mean that I go, <laughs> no. He didn't mean that I'm still in high school. He didn't mean that I'm a child in so far as just what my age is. I'm a child when it comes to having to lead. I'm a child instead of having to rule. I'm not adequate to rule. I am inferior to rule. And when it comes to ruling like you want that, I would be considered feeble-minded. I would be considered to be a person that don't know how to lead and rule and know what judgment is, okay? This is what he's saying, and I'm asking us, 
Are we ready to rule? Are we just going to allow people to be over us continually as our gov in our governmental positions, in our church positions, or in, in so far as any place where we have to follow the lead of other people that we have something to do with them being over us? Are we going to always be those that are just a child and because I got brute strength or I got an army or I got so many people with me that will stand behind me and let me lead like a child? Then you can find that kind of mess in Isaiah chapter 3, but I'm not going there. So I'm a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And your service is in the midst of a people which thou hast chosen, a great people. They cannot be numbered or counted for multitude. I ask the times people sometimes, if you were in charge of games, well, how would you rule? How would you judge? Would you even go and ask the most high for wisdom or would you judge by the American standard that had a Negro problem? You see, because if you don't understand what it would be for you to be prepared to judge, then how do you pick your leaders? How do you determine what leaders you're going to stay under because you've been under them 20 years, because you've been un under them 30 years, and they haven't been under the Most High God that long? And the Most High God allows you the opportunity to see that and you don't care? You do nothing about it? Really? Really? Then you begin to understand why it is that some people will never turn from darkness to light is because we've been doing it this way this long that's why one moment they want to make a, a god to paul and barnabas and the next minute when he tells them about the righteousness of god they want to stone them okay all right and it says give to thy servant an understanding heart or give to your servant an understanding heart to judge thy people do you understand if the government of the United States or France or Belgium or any place would do righteousness and justice in judgment that the people could be in peace? Now, understand it's not their standard of righteousness and judgment, because when you look at righteousness and just, just judgment, just looking at our own country, you can go look at statutes on the law book that say, you know, if you didn't tilt your hat. At a, at a white woman, you could be locked up and put in jail, and then we could lease you out on a prison form. It was called convict leasing. That's not righteousness. That's not justice. And I refuse to not let us see where we've come from so that we can give the most high God the honor to do his name with what our ancestors went through and show how much we owe him for what he's brought us because we didn't have the weapons to win. And it says that I may discern, that I may discern what I can understand pay attention to, to consider and examine and teach the difference between good and bad. For well, who is able to judge this so great a people? Who is able to judge America righteously? Who is able to judge your home righteously and justly? Who is able to judge in your assembly? Is there anyone that can judge? Paul said one time in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm ashamed that there's no one that can judge. I believe it was the fifth chapter too. He talked about it, but he says in one of them, I believe it's six, he says, and you're puffed up and you have not rather even mourned. That's five. And that that individual can be taken out of the way. So you say in the sixth chapter, you go to law before the unjust, and not before the saints. Don't you know the saints will judge the world? Here Solomon is. I understand the gravity of the moment. I understand the gravity of the time it is right now. And I need that wisdom. Do you ever pray for the wisdom? Listen to me. Do you ever pray for the wisdom when somebody come? One person has an issue with, a, say, a brother with another brother or a father with a daughter or a father with a son or a person that's called a sister with another sister or this person and you want to arbitrate but you don't know what to do maybe you like this one better than the other one maybe this one has more money this one is more convincing this one is crying when they talk you need the wisdom of god most high the judge give me an understanding heart not to understand the person, an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this great people? And the speech pleased the Lord. And he said, because you didn't, you because you asked for this thing instead of long life, I want you to understand 
This is what Solomon is going to go and try to get after God has already promised it to him. Because you have asked for this thing and have not asked for thyself long life, neither have you asked for the riches for thyself, neither have you asked for the life of your enemy, but have asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment, to lead, to govern the people. That's what the kings would do. Behold, I have done according to your word. I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart. Not just wise and understanding. He said, I've done what you asked to your word. I have given you a wise and an understanding heart to do judgment so that there will be none like thee before thee, neither shall there any arise like unto thee. Now, what I want you to understand is this is what Solomon asked for. What was the requirement of Solomon? What was the requirement of an individual that's going to lead the most high people? Let's go to Deuteronomy 17 and 15. I got a, uh, on the conference line. I need somebody to mute their phone for me, please. Uh, just mute it. That's all. On Deuteronomy 7, 17 and 15, Israel, he says, thou shalt in any wise, he's talking about if they want a king, and he said, this is how you do it. Set him king over thee, whom Yahweh, thy God, shall choose. One from among thy brethren shall thou set over thee, that thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. I don't want anybody coming in from another nation, an international person, I don't want you going and getting somebody from over there in Canaan to be over you that's not an Israelite. I don't want you to go get anybody from Assyria. I don't want you to get anybody from Babylon. I don't want you to go up to Northeast Africa and go across the abroad and get somebody from Spain. I don't want you to get anybody from Portugal. I don't want you to go get any Greeks. I don't want you to get any Romans. I don't want you to get any British to be over you. I want you to set a king over you whom I choose of your brethren because I only have given them the laws, my statutes, my covenants, and my ordinances. Everybody don't know. They have their own standard. In Canaan, they had the code of Hammurabi. And I own it. And I read in it. It's not the same as Yah. Verse 16. It says, you don't, well, let me finish 15 again, that thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother, but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt. The most high God, now understand when this was given, they haven't gone into the promised land. They haven't gone through the seven rises and falls of it. Well, let's go through the first one. First one with Joshua, when they get in, and after Joshua dies, you have seven rises and falls in the book of Judges. You get to the book of Ruth. You find that at this time, it keeps saying around the end of the book, there was no king. There was no king. They talk about no king. I believe they say that in Judges. And there was still no king over them in the book of Ruth. And we find out at the end of the book of Ruth. That's a real quick jump, Tim. It is. People can read the book of Ruth. It's only four, four pages or four chapters. At the end of the book of Ruth, Boaz, a great man of God, most high Yahweh Elohim, he takes this woman, and because he's already prepared for himself, and because he's in the position of being able to do for other people, he can have a wife. And he took this woman, and this woman had already been married, and her husband had died, and he's going to keep the name alive of the man that died. And so they had a child, the child's name was Obed. Obed had a child, and that child's name was Jesse. And when Jesse ends up having a child, that child's name is David. So we may be talking about 600 years or more. But Yahweh's telling them way before it happens, because for Yahweh to know the future, he knows the past, he knows the time what is. Yahweh had already given the narrative on what the king would be like. He had already given the narrative on how the kingship would be run. In, in Latin, they call it ad hoc. He's not coming after the fact and telling you how to do. He's telling you ahead of time, like he tells us, like he tells we husbands, we wives, how to raise our children. So he says, but he shall not multiply horses. And let's look at what Solomon did. In First Kings, we, the information was given way ahead of time. First King, what did Uncle Solomon do? 
The Bible says, and Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Okay, let's look again. Let's look at 10 and 26. And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen, and he had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen. We see it, First Chronicles 1 and 16. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt and linen and yarn, and the king's merchants received linen at a price. Let's look at this last one here, 9 and 28, First Chronicles. And they brought unto Solomon horses out of Egypt and out of all lands. But what had God most had told him? What did he tell him how to live? How had he told the king before the king ever got to be on the throne? He said that the king was not supposed to multiply to himself horses, but Solomon did what he chose to do. Let's read some more. It says to go to himself nor cause the people to return to Egypt. We see that he got the horses out of Egypt and all the other lands. To the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as Yahweh have said unto you, you shall henceforth return no more that way. Now, how plain does the Most High have to say it? You, he's given you wisdom to judge your people. He's given you wisdom to do that. But do you have enough wisdom to stick with his plan? Or have you got too smart? He told you what to do. It's not your wisdom that's keeping the nation. It's the wisdom that he's imparted to you to keep the nation. And when you go outside of that, you're doing the same thing that Eve and Adam did when they went outside the wisdom and the parameters of the Most High God. And you usurped his authority and you ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You showed him you don't have the right to limit my mobility. Say it again, Tim. You don't have the right to limit my mobility. Verse 17, neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. You didn't see the most high God say, don't do that, right? Listen to what Nehemiah says about this rascal. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 23. After they had gone into captivity, which was a few hundred years later, they had done so wickedly that the Most High thrust them out of the land. And the Bible says, in those days, this is Nehemiah, I saw, is in those days, I also Jews that had married wives of Ashdod and Ammon and of Moab, and their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod. That means half of the speech of the Philistines and could not speak the Jews' language. They couldn't speak the language of Yehude. They couldn't speak the language of the Hebrews. And it says they couldn't speak in the, in, the, in the Jews' language, which was a sign of a curse as well, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them. I fought with them and I cursed them. I don't, they don't mean like I said, GD, this and GD. No, I cursed you that God would damn you. I cursed them and I smote. Look at the beautiful word. I smote. Bam! I smote certain of them and plucked off the hair. Imagine this man, this man of God. The, 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 the church folk couldn't take that this day, even if he was trying to save their lives. No, ma'am, it's gonna be it, it's gonna be okay. It says, and I contended with them and cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked off the hair and made them swear by God saying, you shall not give your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, did not Solomon king of Israel sin by these things? You, I know some of you all think Solomon never did wrong. You all think he had the permission. Solomon was supposed to be the leader in God's kingdom. He was supposed to execute righteousness and judgment. It said, did not Solomon king of Israel sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his Elohim. And God Elohim made him king over all of Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. 
and the righteous Nehemiah says, shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil? I can discern between good and evil. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil to transgress against our God Elohim and marrying strange wives? Now, this is the assessment of the man of God, Nehemiah, about the folly that, so that Solomon executed in multiplying wives to himself after he was told not to do it. Look at what the Bible says about Solomon before we get to Nehemiah, a few hundred years before Nehemiah, because this is way before the captivity. But look at what the Bible says when it gives the narrative on Solomon. And it says in 1 Kings chapter 11, let's just go ahead and look at verse 1. But Solomon, but King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughters of Pharaoh, an Egyptian, the women of the Moabites, descendants of Lot, Ammonites, descendants of Lot, Edomites, descendants of Jacob's twin brothers, Zidonians, Canaanites, Hittites, Canaanites, of the nations which concerning which Yahweh had said to the children of Israel, ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you, for surely you they will turn away your heart after their gods. Now, isn't this what the Most High God is saying? For in the day that you eat Eve, uh, at least Adam and Adam would have had to tell Eve, in the day that you eat, you will surely die. That was the judgment. That was the righteous, just law of the almighty God giving his rule to those that are under him as underlings in his army. And he said, you will surely die. Now look at what the most high God had said to Solomon. He said, surely. But some said, no, I won't. He said, surely. And Solomon said, no, I won't. He said, surely. And Solomon said, surely I won't. Look at it. Of the nation which concerning Yahweh said to the children of Israel, you should not go unto them, neither shall they come into you, for surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. You cannot love two masters. The master says, Matthew chapter 6, 24, no man can, no man can love two masters. Either will Hold to the one and despise the other, or he'll let go of the one and hold to the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, if you cannot serve God and mammon, you cannot serve the Elohim of the scripture and another God. He had already told him in the first commandment, I am the Lord your God that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. You will have no other gods before me. You will not make any graven image. You will not take my name in vain. Solomon clave to these in love. He's made himself unfit to judge the most high's people. He's made himself one that won't do righteous judgment. It says Solomon clave to these in love. And he had 700 wives. He told them not to multiply wives. He had 700 wives, princes, and 300 concubines, and his wives that turned away his heart. For well, it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. After, it's good, mom, after other gods and turned it away to other legal systems. What do you mean? Whatever God you have, they have a system of laws that you go by. He left his ability to judge according to God's righteous standard because a man is going to teach and go by God's righteous standard must live by God's righteous standard. It says it came to pass when he was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David, his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonian, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of Yahweh and went not fully after Yahweh, after David, his father. In other words, some of the sex gods. Go look at an Asherah and look at the Asherah poles. And then Solomon did build a high place for Shemash, the abomination of Moab, 
the sun god. In the hill that is before Jerusalem, Molech, they offer their children in fire to Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And you would think that was enough. I would, I really would think that was enough. And the Bible says, and likewise did he for all, and likewise did he for A-L-L, -L, all. Look at the word here. He did likewise for Kol, K-O-L. That means every one of his strange wives. Then burnt incense, which is, the which is the equivalent of prayer, and burnt incense and sacrifice unto their gods. Now, I know Molech had a sacrifice with his children. Some of the other ones can have the same kind, but I'm not going to just teach about all the other gods. What I want you to see, are you ready to lead? Are we ready to lead? If you're ready to lead and do righteousness and justice, you got to be right and just toward the Most High God. If you won't be right and just toward Him, woe be unto me. And it says He did for all His strange wives and burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And Yahweh was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from Yahweh Elohim of Israel which had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but kept not that which Yahweh commanded. Wherefore, Yahweh said unto Solomon, for as much as this is done, and thou have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I commanded thee, I will surely rend thy kingdom from thee and will give it unto thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David, thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. I would to God that we, those in my, in my age group, at least 50 years old, and I mean, yeah, 50 years old and 10 years above my age, that God would spare our children and our grandchildren while we're alive, to give them a chance to do and to learn while we're still here because we would repent and change. Solomon didn't change. So he said he was going to do it for David, his father's sake. And then he says, how be it, I will not rent all of the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to thy son for David, my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. If you if you even know the rest of the story, you know, the rest of what's going on, you'll find out his son was wicked. But let's go back and let's get it. Are we ready to rule? When they talked about the Negro problem, they said we ain't able to rule ourselves. We always have to be in the, in the perpetual state of having the oppressed as being our parent, being the one that took care of us, making the laws for us, telling us where to live, being able to tax us and still use us what they want. Do you really feel this is what God wanted for us? And many go to church every Sunday because we've been taught by them in the Roman Catholic Church, you don't worship on Saturday. You don't worship on Sabbath. And then there's another woman that came up, Ellen G. White, and what she does is what she was she was teaching in the Seventh Day at Venice. And now people think that if you're going to worship on Sabbath, you're Seventh Day at Venice, or you're in some kind of cult. Any one of you all think that when I worship on Sabbath? Show me one place in the Bible where the Bible says that God took the blessing off the Seventh Day. Shit, I, I didn't. That's I, I, all I said. The blessing, because that's how I started. I asked myself if I had two vehicles that look just the same, one is blessed and one is not. Which one would I drive? They're exactly the same. If another house was put beside mine, one is blessed and one is not, which one would I live in? If I had two, two opportunities to have this, two bodies, one blessed, one is not, they're exactly the same. Same scars, same whatever, same stomachs, same gray hair, which body would I choose to live in? If I got a day to worship, which day am I going to worship on? The one that I see that he blessed and never took the blessing off or the one that the Roman Catholic Church have proven and documented that we told you all to worship on this day because of the venerable son under Constantine, the so-called great. Anyway, that's all far as I'm going to go on that. But he told him not to multiply horses. Nor I mean, back, I'm sorry, I'm back in the Deuteronomy 17 and 16. Don't multiply horses for himself 
to call the people to go back to Egypt to the end for as much as he has said, you shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall you multiply wives to yourselves that you turn not your heart away. Neither shall you greatly multiply to yourself silver and gold. You see, on the Sabbath, I talked about these preachers. They go and beg for money. And they've shown what they would do, how they would do things to take from you. Our government does the same thing. You think you own your home? Stop paying property taxes on it for a few years and see what happens. Because what has happened effectively is that you're paying rent on your land. Whereas the Most High God always wanted you to be able to leave your land to your children. Now, understand, American law did not allow us to leave ours to our children. As a matter of fact, when the Freedmen's Bureau, they had Freedmen's Bank, they had all those millions of dollars. Those were taken by the oppressor and the people's land were taken and occupied with somebody else. Do you, are you ready to leave? Are you going to continually prove to the people to say we couldn't leave, that we are imbeciles, that we are inferior, that we are savages, and that we are oversexed? Yes, they said we were oversexed, and they said we got to castrate the males, we got we got to sterilize the women, and yet there's documentation of how many mulatto babies were born on this chart. I may show it to you one day. And just show you that it looked like when you had the evidence and you smell it and you listen to it, it don't seem like it was we being the ones that's doing, but that's not my class tonight. So he said, don't multiply silver and gold. But let's see if Solomon obeyed that. In 2 Chronicles 9 and 13, listen to what God most high says. Solomon, now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 600 Six score, so six score, which is 60, and six talents of gold. Let, let's, let's look at it in American numbers. The weight of the gold that Solomon got in one year was the equivalent of 1,364,800,000 dollars. How did you come up with that, Tim? The ton, let's open up CSV. So that's the way I did it. I thought I had saved the um, I thought I had saved it from the chart, but it doesn't matter. It'll open up right there. You just have to click on it a different way. And let's open up my verse here. It says, I'm in First Chronicles 9 and 13. I can just do it this way. I give it a, a B. It don't matter to you, but it'll make it click to where the other one was. Okay, now. The weight of the gold that came to Solomon annually was 25 tons. I know that a ton is 2,000 pounds, see? So it says the weight that came to Solomon annually was 25 tons, so I made it 50,000 pounds. Brought by the merchants, all of the Arabian kings and governors of the land who brought gold and silver to Solomon. So two tons, 5,000 pounds, one pound at the day when I did this last week, 16 ounces, I mean, at 16 ounces per pound times 50,000 equal 800,000 ounces. Price per ounce at that time, it was 716.22. I guess that was last week. It was 17, it was $1,706 per ounce. I did the math and that's what I came up with. That's the methodology that I got to it. So Solomon, was supposed to multiply gold and silver. Now I want you to see how the ES, I mean, how this version says it. It says, because it says annually here, it says, it says, it says, all of the Arabian kings and governors brought also silver and gold. I don't want that. The weight of gold that came to Solomon annually was 25 tons. Annually. Ooh. That, that, that's more than bringing the tithe, ain't it? That's what he gets annually. Besides that was brought from the merchants and the traders and the Arabian kings and the governors of the land also brought gold and silver to Solomon. Solomon made two, look at this, Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold, 15 pounds of hammered gold went into each shield. Now, what I need you to understand about that hammered gold and that shield, from what I understand, they make these big, tall shields and they would have men going around you left, right, front, and back. So when the sun hit it, it would be glorious like you were in the sun. 
And it says the gold went in the ink shield. And I'm not going to read about the cups and things that were made out of gold. I just wanted you to see that this is how Solomon was bawling or how he was going about his business. And so Solomon was, it was already told for the kings not to do that. Let me go back some more and look at where we are. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Let me put it back in here. So Deuteronomy chapter 17, let's go back to past the horses. It says, he did not, not the multiply silver and gold, and it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this Torah, this law in the book, out of which is before the priest and the Levites. Now you're going to have the Levites and the priest and the king on the same page with Yah, and it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. This is where his wisdom is supposed to go, come from. This is where his knowledge is supposed to come from. I've given you a wise and understanding heart to do judgment, and therefore, if you read what I say, you're going to know what to do. You're going to know how to make application. You're going to know how these things work, whereas I got to struggle through. You'll understand this. And it says, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear Yahweh his God and to keep all the words of this Torah and his statutes to do them. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, that his heart, that he don't make himself a big wig, that he not make himself somebody so great and got all these shields going around him, that he does not lift himself among his brethren, that he turned out aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Is that what we see? That's the point we're looking at. Is that what we see in the scripture? Let's, now let's go to our text. I, I know that you say, yes, a long way to go, but I want us to know this. I talk to most people that know something about Solomon. They can't tell us this. How are we going to benefit? How are we going to know when we see preachers being greedy dogs and ravening wolves? And then we see them do this over and over again. We see politicians come and promise you they're going to do something. And they still kill your baby. They still get paid. They still get the check. They still get the fly on jets. They still get pictures. And yet you're still in poverty. They still taking money and say, look, if your church don't do so and so, we'll do this to you. We got people on every end, the politician, the priest, and we can, yes, the clergy, and we got other people that don't care. Are we ready to lead? When you get ready to lead, you won't just allow anybody to be over you. You can set people down. I know some people don't want to lead their church where they're in, but are there any men left that want to do God's judgment? So Solomon said, I said to my heart, go now, I will prove thee with mirth. What Solomon says is that I will test you with jubilation. I'm going to test you with sensual pleasure. Is this the mark of the man that's supposed to be following what God told him in Deuteronomy 17? Is this a man that's going to do righteousness and judgment, although God has given it to him? He says, I'm going to prove you with mercy. Well, he said, it may not be that bad. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. Go and inspect it. I clicked on the word here. Go and inspect Ria. Inspect, look up, examine pleasure, and behold, he said, this is vanity. Do you think there's any of God's righteous laws, his instructions, his commandments, and his judgment that is vanity? The Bible tells me his father David said there are more to be desired than gold, 19th chapter. Yea, than much fine gold, pleasure, and sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Benefit, moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them, there is great reward. Verse 2, I said of laughter, it is mad, it is mockery. See the word here? Let me let it play. Halal. Halal. Halal, it is mockery. It is mockery. It is like to act like a madman. I, I, I thought of laughter. Maybe I get me some... Some com comedians to come up there and it made me laugh or make me laugh. Well, maybe I got somebody as wicked as Richard Pryor, or maybe I got me somebody as thoughtful as Chappelle Show. But I got me somebody that made me laugh. He said, What do it then? You know, because used to they would have something called the court gesture. 
And it says, I sought in my heart to give myself to wine. Wait a minute. You are the king. You ask God for wisdom to judge. Have you seen anything yet that I just read that many of our leaders don't do today? You think they don't get together and do wine and do debauchery and seek pleasure and laugh? And then they would call us imbeciles. They would call us retarded. They would say that we would have maybe like an adult mind, not adult, but a mind that was incapable of learning. I saw it in my heart to give myself to wine. What does the Bible say about people giving themselves to wine? I, I, I want us to begin to look. Let me do one thing here so that I'll be able to get back and forth like I want to. Um, ECC 2. You don't want that. You want that. Now, let's go back to here. I don't even want that. Okay, it's mad. He said, I give myself to wine. Let's look at how this works. The same Solomon says, wine is a mocker, like something to laugh at. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived, deceived, go astray, thereby is not wise. Look at it. God, people say, you can't drink wine. It says, whosoever is deceived, to be infatuated, to make to look foolish, to make a mockery of, or act like a madman or to stagger. That person is not wise. It didn't say anybody that drunk some wine. Jesus drank wine. Don't play. He drank enough wine. They called him a wine bibber. Look up wine bibber and see. He wants somebody to just take a look. You thinking wine sipper. They said wine bibber, they called him. The fear of the king is as a roaring lion. And who provoketh him to anger sinneth against his own soul. Do you want a king judging over you that's living like that? I don't. Look at what the Bible says here in Proverbs. Same man. Proverbs 23, he said he gave himself to wine. He says, whoso has woe, who has sorrow, who has contention, who has babbling, who has wounds without cause, who has redness of eyes. They that tarry long at wine they didn't go and seek mixed wine but notice what this man said i saw in my heart to give myself unto wine what does that give me look at give open up the dictionary to look to let wine seize me carry me off pull or drag or draw out notice i because give don't always mean that the context of the word here listen to it carry off pull a drink i say i'm gonna let wine take me where it wants to take me how is this how we gonna do judgment is this how we gonna is this who we gonna let lead us but the point being made is the most high god gave solomon that wisdom to lead and the judge and look at what he's doing with all that wisdom maybe we don't care but I do. So it says, they that tarry long, they had given themselves long at the wine, seek mixed wine, look not upon the wine when it is red, when it gives its color to the cup, and it moves itself aright, and at last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth as an adder. And look at what the man says, thine eyes shall behold strange women. What did Nehemiah say? He had those strange women. Strange means foreign. Foreign means from another land. Nehemiah called them outlandish women. And your heart, your heart shall utter perverse things. This is what I want you to see. This man. He said, I'll give myself the wine and I might let you see one more. Look at what happens when leaders give themselves over to the wine. Now, the Bible says in Isaiah, talking about leaders, are you ready to rule? Are you ready to, are you going to continually let somebody rule you that don't take justice and judgment seriously? It says about the leaders, it said, they have erred through wine and through strong drink, they are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. The priest and the prophet, and now we see the king. 
They are swallowed up of the wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in what? Judgment. They stumble in judging. Some of us are drunk, not with wine, but drunk with propaganda. Drunk with the history that have been given to us. Drunk with the political correctness. Do you think that if wine can alter your mind, what about the thoughts that are given to you that goes against God's word? What about the thoughts that's telling you that you are nothing? What about the thoughts that telling you that you are just a baboon over there in Africa when the most high God had built us up to be like him? You tell somebody that if you don't pay the tithe like that man, his name was Alan McNair Sr., and when those two women used to come to our Bible class, said that we, they told us that we didn't pay this tithe. He said he told the whole church, y'all got to get out because y'all not bringing a curse on this church. Because Solomon had proven himself to be a money man. Solomon had proven himself to be a ladies man or a woman man. Solomon had proven himself that he loved a lot of religion. Solomon had proven himself that not only could he do that, but we're going to get that. He liked to build stuff. I won't get to finish it, but I needed us to understand. So when you look at this book of Ecclesiastes, when you look at when they offer you money, when they offer you to get the hundredfold blessing, when you can get the thousandfold blessing, or you sell your house, or when somebody tell you, you vote this way, we're going to give you this, or vote this way, we're going to give you this, or when she or he said, I will pleasure you like you want to be pleasured, that you can look back and see a man that knew God's judgment and turned away from God's judgment little by little. He said it was vanity. Are you going to get somebody giving you over a billion, 300 million every year annually, not counting the other gold and silver, not counting the houses, not, no! But what will you give in exchange for your soul? Who will you let lead you? Are we ready to grow up? Or do you want to always let it be until they completely exterminate us, which is in many of the documents that they wanted to do and that they tried to do and God didn't let it work? Are we ready to lead saints? Are we ready to make our father's name and his words be what he hear come out of our mouth? Or will they always hear Washington, Patrick Henry, the Senate, the Congress, the Constitution, the different laws, the different things of debauchery, her choice, the opinions of men come out of our mouth? Because if you're going to allow the opinions of man to come out of your mouth, it will be those that are in charge over you. Because they're going to tell you what to say. They're going to tell you what to think. They're going to take the place of your most high. So they stumble in judgment, verse number seven, for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness. It says, to whom shall he teach knowledge? And to whom shall he make understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and are drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And these people, that were those kind of people, they turned away from Yah. And Yah said with stammering lips and with another tongue, will he speak to this people to whom he says, this is the rest where they may cause the weary to rest. This is the refreshing that they would not hear. But the word of Yahweh was to them precept upon precept upon precept, line upon line. Here, the little and there, you can read the rest of that, but Solomon had it all. But he gave himself over to do this type of thing. And this is what happened. Lastly, on this about leaders, people giving themselves over to the wine, I want you to just see in brief this man as a leader of his people, gave himself over to what Solomon gave himself over. He got, I won't say skint. I can't think of a different word. Look at what the Bible says here in the 16th verse of 1 Kings 20. And it says that they went out at noon. Ben-Hadad is the one that's being the fool. Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk in the pavilion. He and the kings, the 30 and two kings that helped him. So does that mean 33, 32 plus one? Okay. And the young men of the princes of the provinces went out first and Ben-Hadad sent out and they told him saying, there are men come out of Samaria. And he said, whether they come out for peace, take them alive. 
or whether they come out for war, take them alive. See how the wine talking? When you don't realize you're in war, you think you may be able to talk your way through something. When the most I tell you, you don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. Understand that those principalities and powers work through individual governmental systems. It works through your leaders. It'll work through their leaders. It'll work through your priests. It was working through Solomon. It was working through Saul. It took up resident David for a minute. We always should be paying attention. Are we ready to leave? Should God put us in that position? So these young men of the princes went out and came out of the city and the army followed them. And they slew everyone, his men, and the Syrians fled. And Israel pursued them and ben the king of Syria, escaped on a horse with his horsemen. And the king of Israel went out and smote the horses and the chariots and slew the Syrians with a great slaughter. Again, because this man was drunk. Let's get to what we can end for our class on this one. It says, I sought myself to give myself to wine and yet acquainting myself with wisdom and to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men that they should do under heaven all of the days of their life. Let's look at the folly. He gave himself to folly. Look at what he says about folly. It says, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary. apothecary. What they do is they would mix together your medicines. They would mix their herbs. So the apothecary, that's what that was called. So it said, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. Now, when I was a boy, we used to have to say a Bible verse when we got ready to eat. And I chose that one when they were sitting there and I said, Dead flies cause a woman of the apothecary to send forth a stinking save, and I couldn't hold my face straight. And my mom got all upset with me, but it was Bible verse. And you kind of get an idea what kind of child I was. But anyway, if you've ever seen fly traps where they have some kind of liquid in it, when the flies come in and they say there may be a hundred or something you see around horses' stable or, or some restaurants, that almost smells like a dead body all that bacteria and stuff, the filth and the stench. And it says dead flies cause the ointment that could benefit you of the apothecary to send forth a stinking smell. It says, so doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. You're going to be a wise man, but you're going to be foolish. You're going to be drunk. You're going to do ungodly judgment. You're going to say people are imbeciles when they're not. You're going to kill babies when they're not babies. You're going to come back later and say, I didn't. You're going to go tell people, I wish you were shot dead because you didn't say a doctor. You're going to come back and say, I didn't really mean it like that. You're going to tell a woman you love her. Then you come back and say, you don't love her. You're laying up with your girlfriend. You're going to tell the truth. You're going to teach them what's right. And you don't. You send them to school. They're going to turn them against God. And then when they come back in your house with different lifestyles you want to have something to say dead flies make the ointment of the apothecary stink our folly it will stink one day in our children knows it'll stink one day possibly in our nose it'll stink in our friends though but most of all it's going to stink in the sight of god if you got a reputation for wisdom and honor Never leave God's word to go and seek folly. Never leave God's word to go find another source of wisdom. Don't do it. It'll cost you. Isaiah 9, 12. You know, let me look at my time. You know, I can just stop right here. I can just stop right here. It's because it's going to get worse and worse before we get to chapter 3. And when we start talking about everything has a time and a place. But I need us to understand there's more than one wisdom. And Solomon had a mandate. And if we can see that Solomon had a mandate and he has given us the blueprint of how to turn away from God most time when you have everything. I remember knowing a man in an, in an area where I grew up. He had a wife, good looking, uh, fit. And I saw the woman that he cheated on his wife with in it was almost like Big Bird, okay, but just didn't look the same, but made, and it was just amazing. How, how could you do that? 
I can understand. But just like a man, it looks like his wife is what they call a dime. For those that don't know what's a dime, you can say voluptuous, beautiful, uh, breathtakingly spectacular. And then he go get somebody else that maybe been on the street letting bathe, and this is the one he want to lay up with. Don't you think that's what we do when we trade God? Jeremiah says, how can you trade me? Rivers of, rivers of living water, streams of living water, and go drink out of a cistern, a broken cistern. If you know what a six cistern is, it's a big hole dug in the ground. They slap mortar on it, and the water runs down in it from the rain and off of whatever, whatever it comes from. If it's underground and it doesn't have anything over, then anything can run in it. If it's over the ground, something can crawl in it. It can get bacteria. And you'd rather drink from that and it's seeping into the ground and the ground is seeping into it than the living water. The most high asked through his son, what were you given in exchange for your soul? This man, Solomon, had the wisdom to judge and be mature. We could still be ruling today. But he want to know about mirth. He want to enjoy pleasure. Okay, it's vain. I learned that. I experienced it. I know. Then laughter. And I wanted to play mad. And then I gave myself to let wine drag me away. And, and, I, and I know I'm supposed to be doing judgment, but I want to do this too. Then he want to say what's good for the sons of men. Well, I'm going to tell you before we get to the Bible saying Micah 6 and 8, he has shown the old man. He has shown you Solomon. Let's look at that and then let, let, let's go into discussion. I want, to, I want us to see it. I don't want it just to be Solomon. He says he has showed the old man what is good. God is the, narr the narrator of what is good. He has showed, he, and what does Yahweh require? What is your duty of thee? But to do justly, but to do justice, but to do that with, that's what your job was, Solomon. That's what your job is, Tim. That's what your job was, people in the United States, when you brought us over here, you shouldn't have been bringing us over here when you did, but those that had the ability to do justice, you should have done it, you should have fought for us like you fought Britain, like you did in the American Revolutionary War, like you did for the Civil War, you should have fought for us, but now you have brought damnation and blood on America. He said he has shown you to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly, humbly. Solomon wasn't walking humbly. Solomon was walking like he was over something because when the Messiah came, he humbled himself. He became obedient, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Solomon wasn't humble unto death. Solomon elevated himself and we do the same thing. Are we ready to leave? Are we ready to humiliate ourselves before God so that he can elevate us? Are we willing to see our leaders be humble before God? Or are we still going to praise him and pat him on the back and give him money and make everything be okay? We walk humbly with thy God. We're not through. What we're doing is we just putting the pause right here. And while we got a pause right here, we'll be able to go into on Sabbath that they had the works he built, the garden, the orchards, and how he lived lavishly. But the people still needed justice. Are we ready? Are we ready to rule? Are we ready to be adults? Or we will always allow somebody else to rule over us. Solomon had that ability and gave it up. How much more us who have never been granted all that wisdom and understanding from the most high? By his spirit, we can overcome and lead and rule. Father, I thank you for your mighty word. I thank you for your examples. I thank you for the narrative that you give and people will exchange. That you have a righteous standard and no man escapes the judgment. You're letting us see through your word what Solomon did by some of the prophets, what was told ahead of time by your narrative, what would happen if they turned. And then you even let this man speak himself of his father. Protect us from all those that are supposed to be over us, from all those that take the position of executing judgment and penalties on, uh, on us. Grant us to grow up and be in that position to do righteousness and justice for your name's sake in the kingdom of your son, whose kingdom is established in righteousness and justice henceforth now and forever, and your zeal 
the zeal of your armies will perform it. Help us to be ready to take our role when our turn comes. Amen. Amen. And even so, amen. I now open our class for discussion, if there's to be any discussion tonight. And I surely hope I was clear. Even if I made someone angry, they can tell me. Well, I appreciate everybody joining me tonight. I got the chance to get us really into this Solomon thing because now that we've gotten into him, we're going to be able to see not only parallels, but how we can forfeit our right to judge, forfeit our right to lead. And it won't be anybody's fault but our own. So if I if if I need to, somebody just they can just text me on the um, chat and tell me, you know, we, re we ready to just shut down the class and I'll do it. I think that it was emphasized tonight to obey. Mm. I mean, you know, in the way the scriptures are laid out, the Lord seems to, I won't say always, because I'm thinking of some other answers, but. He gives his instruction and he says it's going to happen. So to see, to see Solomon do this, it's, uh, you know, when the scriptures say things are written for our learning, we really need to understand he, he, he had so much and he lost. And what just stands out to me is that this was in his old age. So we, we can't really, we should not be thinking that we got a lot of time. And even that, you know, you mentioned again of wisdom. You can, a lot of people feel like street wisdom can help you, but it won't, it won't keep you. It won't have, it won't preserve you through eternity. So a lot of times people value the wisdom. Um, you say you ain't, you ain't lived because you haven't experienced some things. Yes, And Lord. they're trying to make it like, they'll make it like, you're you're less than, or you uh, are without, let's say, riches. You you missed out. People doing education all the time. You haven't traveled here. You haven't got this degree. And some of the most miserable people walking around. But anyway, so that's out of Ahab, and the stubbornness that he had when he even said that. Uh, Jehoshaphat says, is there, is there a righteous uh, man? And Ahab's like, well, I really don't want to hear him. <laughs> he <laughs> He's did. Like, I'm not gonna mention it. He's not going to even mention him. And so Jehoshaphat, well, ain't there somebody here? Maybe think of Corinthians 6, like you were saying. Ain't there somebody here? And he said, um, well, there's, I don't want to say, my, my, I get the name Micaiah, Micah. I, I get the name mixed up. Um, and he said, he always tell me what I don't want to hear. And that's bad. You a king. Your kingdom not supposed to be split, so that's bad already. You happen to perpetuate this uh, thing that Jeroboam did where you got these false worship centers. And you know that you're supposed to be listening to something else. But it's like, <laughs> I hate it. He was honest in that. He said, I don't want to hear it. That's right. <laughs> and then he said, if I'm not, you you think that when he said, if I'm not a prophet, of, I think he said, if I'm not a prophet of God, you, you know, he said, Israel's going to be scattered and you're going to be, what is it, dead? You, you say, or something like that. I, I forget the exact thing. Like you, they're going to be, they're going to be, they're going to be up there on the mountain like sheep without a shepherd. And then he told me, if you yeah, come, if you, if you come back, I can tell you this. I'm not a man of God. Yeah. I, I love Didn't that kind of talk. Didn't he say he would die too? That, 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 the, implica the, the, implication, the implication, the implication is there. You're not coming back. Yeah. Period. Yeah, so to sort of see that, but uh, 
the scripture does tell us the one that thinks he stands, they be, be, beware, you know. So a lot of these people, you know, we don't, we don't have anything to worry about. Or, you know, we, we, we just, we, we, we said what we're supposed to say. Or, and, let's, and, and let's tie the ties back in there. We gave our ties. But that's willingly ignorant. That is willingly ignorant, you know, because there's enough, I believe, out there for people to understand. Well, what, 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 uh, when you hear someone else speak against that, be willingly ignorant because it don't, it don't speak to what the heart wants. So uh, I think it was a strong minder, and and then it, it is really, it's, it's, it's the obedience. It's the obedience. So I don't remember what your title was, what, what was your title? Are we ready to lead? Or okay. are we ready to stop following those who are not leading righteously? Mm-hmm. Okay. Those are, those are thoughts I had, so. Well, I, I, I appreciate your thoughts. Because what ends up happening is, for the most part, for the most part, we've already, it's already been labeled in the United States that we will never lead. We will never lead. We will always be led. We will always need to be handled by handlers that can put us in zoos or in cages like they did Otabanga, or that they can do us like they did um, Sarah Bartman and parade us around naked or that they can make little uh, little clown shows and things and say this is how they lived in the jungle and the people come say ooh they so cute ooh they so savage ooh are we ready to lead haven't we been tired long enough yeah. being by words to what precious that that are we ready to lead or are we ready to stop following those who lead in error? Because I said it many semantic ways, you know. And the main point of, are we, are we ready to take charge now? I don't think that we are. Most of us don't know what righteous so judgment. Say what? One verse. What verses did you cover from um, Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes. Let me run backwards. I believe it's two, one through four. But let me let me come back to it. Give me just a beautiful second. There is Logos. I went from Ecclesiastes two all the way down to four. Now, I know in to- You been, you been what? Oh, kind of oh. Please, break. Go ahead. Go ahead. Based on what I know about what you know, if if we knew how badly we look in the eyes of the majority or the elite, they think we'll never be able to lead and that they got to lead us where they want to. And you remember the time they set up a thing called the American Colonization Society? Well, we just, listen, well, let's just ship them back to Africa. Let's just ship them somewhere and get them away from him because they, they make America look bad. And never think about, in as much as a man would take a brand and brand a woman's face and it get a keyload on it and look bad. And then he talk, looks at her and says, girl, you ugly. That thing on your face look bad. And you're the cause of it. The most high God sent an adversary against Solomon. He sent an adversary against us. The moment we are ready to humble ourselves and pray and turn from our wicked ways 
and seek his face, those are the days when we're getting ready to lead. But it ain't going to be because we get another education or another degree. But go ahead, precious love. You, you know, your title makes me think about um, when they first asked for Kenya and, and, and Samuel, her Samuel. Right. Um, chapter 8, I think. It is. And the reason, and, and they gave these reasons why, and they said that, you know, he's old and his children are not right, and just give us somebody that can go in and out for us. And, and look good. Okay. I'm sorry. And and say and look good. Like we, we want to be like the nations and and as a he said protest to them about so, uh, protest to them. Tell them tell them what their king will be like. And he did. And they say, well, we choose to do it. I think it's verse 20. Yes, let me go ahead and turn to keep talking. Where they say, well, okay, well, that's fine. We'd rather be like the nation. And the most I said, it's not an offense against you, Father, but it's an offense against me because they refuse to have me to rule over them. I was their king. There it is, verse 11. Can okay, you see it? Okay, wait a minute. I can make it big if you need me to. I want uh, verse 8. I want verse 20, I want verse 20, I think. Okay. Because this was their conclusion that they told him after he told them what their king would be like. There we go. There it is. Move up to 19. Okay, that, I can't see what I'm looking for. Okay, let me do Nevertheless, this. the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battle. Now, they didn't want to fight. They wanted some sort of standing army. They didn't want to be responsible for fighting. They said, well, will they will do it because we don't like the way you judge us. And we don't like when you tell us to do something and we don't do it, then, but then we decide to do it and you say it's too late. We don't like that. We don't like having to come to you and bow down to you and humble ourselves before you. We don't like to go out to war for you. We really don't want to fight. What, I, what, we're, what they were asking for is give us a standing army so that we will not be responsible for fighting for you, for fighting for you in these lands and doing your bidding in the earth. And to see that, you know, that, okay, every time he, he gave him, he gave him um, Saul. He even tried to give, he even gave Saul a new heart. See, even in your objecting to, to his rulership, I want to even still try to give you what you need. Even though you don't want me, I can, mm. I can even try to give this person a part of me. So that he could do what I asked for him to do. And so you see what Saul, I mean, what uh, Saul did. And he had a new heart. And he was given another spirit to still do the most high will. Amen. But the going out and coming in, I remember, um, if I'm not mistaken. Moses say, I'm, I'm old now, I'm 120 years old, and I can no longer go out and come in. These people, there was really no standing army to 
people had to fight in their family. The people had to fight. Everyone, every male was responsible for fighting. They didn't want to fight in the family. You know, have a standing army. You just don't, if you want, if you want to put other people, other nations, mercenaries, however you want to do it, we don't want to fight in the battle. On the job. We don't want to do it. And we really don't want to be judged by you. We don't. So even when you tell us how bad it is, we say, oh, we'll accept that over you. We'll accept that over you. And don't we do that now? Yes. So we say, we'll accept Warnock over you. We'll yes. We'll accept Joe Biden over you and Kamala Harris. Yes. We'll accept uh, 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 Donald Trump over you. We'll yes. accept, you know, Republicans over you. We'll accept Democrats over you. As long as we don't have to fight for you. That's right. As long as we don't have to we'll put up with your mouth, Lord. Bow down. What are you saying? I didn't hear you, sweetie. I said, as long as we don't have to listen to God's mouth, right? We despise his word. Right. Right. As long as we don't have to do that. And we'll take everything he has afforded us. That's true. And we'll give it or place it underneath the nation. And say, you will love us. You take, you take charge. You worry about this and you worry about that. And you go to war and we'll sit back. And you judge and you tell us what's right and what's wrong. And you use the media. You use your judicial system, which is a legal system. And not a system of justice. Now that's the because truth. We don't really care. We don't really care. We want to do what Solomon did. We want to indulge in folly. We want to indulge in vanity and vexation of spirit. We love it. It fills our days. Yes. It warms our night. We love it. And you all to pay for it. Right. So, I mean, that was just a thought I had. I mean, uh, uh, it's sad. It's sad. And it's and it's so real in our lives that often we don't even realize we're living under that. We are still living under it. The narrative is the same. The people have changed. Right, and he said, and you were, you were um, in First Kings chapter three, and he was talking about. He said, "I'm, I'm a, I'm a little child." Right. And some of us don't know that we are children in our understanding. We are children because we've chosen to be children, not because you know we're young in age or, or they, if there's no information available or that things have been kept from you. Right. There was a time in our people that knowledge was kept from our people, that reading and understanding and information was kept from our people. And now our people have the tendency to say, we don't want it, we don't care. So that still sounds like and a child. We find, some, we, we find some narrative that sounds good when we talk to other people and we put that in our mouth. And we are children in our understanding. And yet we go to church. That's the best. We, the... we love the Lord and we sing hymns and, and, and we say we're doing all this praying and praying in tongues. And when it comes to real judgment and real understanding, when it comes to the Most High and His will, we're children, but we're rebellious children. We're not children because, you know, just because you're growing up and people love to say, well, I'm a babe. You're choosing to be a babe. That's a choice. Even children don't like to, uh, even a child don't like to say a child. They, when you pick them up, they'll say, put me down. Especially the boys. They want to go run. They, they, when you 
do something for them. They say, I want to do it. They even want to grow up. That's so unnatural, so isn't it? Oh, I'm sorry. I just said that's so unnatural not to want to grow up. It's so unnatural. I'm just thinking about, you know, what you're saying. I remember hearing a little boy say so long, get down, get down, get down, get down. And we'll try to fight you to get down to do it. Yes. Yeah. Just don't call on me to fight. In the days of Joshua, he said, I, I, I'm i still strong and I can still go out and, and, and come in. Yes. And I, I strip is the same. But he said for this reason, to go to war. He did. To go to war. And when you don't understand that it's warfare around you, you are You'll be taken like a child. Mm. You'll be swept up. And you'll find yourself fighting against the people who fight for the Lord. Yes. And be bold with it. Yes, I'm thinking about in the days of, you know, we know Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who called Israel to sin. That's what we remember about him. But that was time Solomon even said, this is the industrious fellow. And he wanted him to work for him. And he was good and the people saw something in him. And Solomon chased this man out of town. I'm going to kill you. And he fled to Egypt. Because he was afraid that someone had come along that he saw that it's like maybe, maybe people would like him better than me. Maybe he'll actually be good at and use wisdom in the right way. And I've gotten out of hand and I don't want him to come and take over. Just find yourself fighting against people who will do and fight for the kingdom and do certain things. And, and sometimes you, that'll turn their heart. That'll turn their heart, even against the most high. So, the damage we can do when we don't choose wisdom, not only just in our judgment, but in our walk with him. We have to walk according to wisdom. Amen. And you have people, you, it's, it's like the parents tell the children, don't do what I do, do what I say. Mm -mm. Well, stop doing what you do and do what you say. <laughs> that that's good. I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody reverse that. But that's what it, that's really what it boils down to. Reverse that. Don't come out. Don't do as I say. I mean, do it. Do as I do. Do as I say. No. Don't don't say what you say. Do what you say. Yes. Because even we know that our parents can tell us we have some wisdom to give us, even though they haven't done it. But it's so hard to comprehend and to do it when we have had a constant example of the wrong. It's so hard to get away from it. And it's like we, we want to walk away from those traditions. We want to walk away from thinking we know and thinking we understand and allowing the nation to tell us how we, should, how we should think about this world. We, you know, most people don't like you even, even to say that someone is evil. Don't say that. Well, we have a description of what evil is in the scripture, and that should be our definition, and we should call it as we see it. Mm. I'm glad I'm glad so, yeah. you I'm glad you broke we that down. Go ahead. No, no, I was just saying I was glad you broke that down. Go ahead. Right. Finish explaining it. I just wanted you to know. Yes. Yeah. We we refuse to do this wisdom. So many of us refuse to pick up the book and 
read it. Why do you think that is at this late date? I think because we've, we've had some success in the world, you know, and I do mean in the world. And I do mean that when we set out to be like the nation, we accomplished it. But yes. many times to our detriment, but as long as we can find some success, some glory, something to glory in, if it's I have a house, I have a business, I have this brand new car, I can vacation wherever I want to. This takes this is these are the things that take us out of the fight. Okay. Comfort. And we feel like we're comfortable and we have a good job. And they've told us that this was this is what life consists of. This is the abundant life as you said before. I can see that. And we know that ain't even life. We know that ain't even life. He says we used to know him and his son. So that makes sense. I, I can grasp that. So anyway, I'm done talking because I felt like I was rambling with you were but you were rambling well. Is there anyone on the conference line? Is there anyone else before I close out? Is there anybody that benefited? That make anybody angry? No angry, just a good lesson. Don't have too much to comment, but I just want to let you know it was a beautiful lesson. And uh Okay. Benefit from it, you know. Look power. like Elder Lane trying to say something. Go ahead. I was saying, uh, it's not that I have a, a rebuttal or comments, comment, but I'm just passing comments to let you know that the lesson was beautiful and it was very educational. You Thank know, you. Um, and uh, you didn't make me mad, but you taught me something. Okay. Uh, that's you know that's it i'm not gonna hold everybody much longer because uh you know but it was a beautiful lesson and uh you know being there been there done that seen it me too but, me too you know live long you see a lot Elder Lane, you're older than I am. How do you think it would, what difference do you think it would make the people if they could just really hear the people talk about how stupid they felt that we were, how we never would be able to do for ourselves, that we needed them for everything, that you can't even trust us with money. Like for instance, if we say that America really took and stole from us and just like they paid other people back for what they stole, even the people that were here after us, the ones they call Indians, because mm. a lot of people don't know old make people were us, but the point being made, they say, what they going to do with it? I mean, they, all they going to do is lose it. Uh, you they, know, I mean, when I hear, it's as if that stigma that we are still the least of all the humans on the earth when the Most High God said that we were, but I'm going to make you the head and not the tail. We decided here. Yeah, we going to stay at the tail and enjoy it and love it. So we're going to it. remake ourselves in the image of man. And in the image of man, we'll create ourselves to be just like them and get the same kind of thing because guess what? Just like the Most High God will not let you override Him to be His God and to tell us what to and tell us to tell Him what to do, the leaders in this society are the same way. And without the hand of God, we'd have stayed in Egypt. And without the hand of the Most High God in our lives, we'll still stay just like they have us right now. And I just wonder what that would be like. Or what do you think would be like people in your age group to see what they really did do to kill us off? Well, 
it's like <laughs> me myself that's why i say i've seen it all been there and from times i mean you know like 75 years is not a uh, 175 years but from a small boy to now i see things that i never would thought we would do to each other i never thought i would see the day come when i could not turn my back on you and you know be afraid that uh something would happen to me you know so i uh but it 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 it, it would be amazing to take this generation now back to the 50s and see how they would survive mm when even in the 50s <laughs> and i I'm, I'm i'm speaking um 8 9 years old when you out in the public and you got to go to the bathroom and it's a sign say here's a bathroom but it's a sign say white only and uh you got to use the bathroom but you can't go in there because you know that's that's not for you you see would they be man or bowl like they are now to one another to each other and say oh man i ain't studying now i'm going to use this bathroom mm. yeah or would they mees down like they did in the 50s oh uh, that's white folk man let me go run in these bushes over here and that's what we did you know it was some you know and, and like i say being a, a a very disobedient child uh i ain't studying that sign i can't read no way you know they already say i'm stupid so i can't read i ain't know that was to say white folks only I, all i saw is say bathroom you know <laughs> so you know but they would not and, and you know they would not survive they would not survive i mean and it, it would be a strange and like i say you know and before like my granny used to always tell me she said boy you ain't going to live long cuz you just don't listen to nobody i said granny i'm a man like them <laughs> and you know i'm sorry but <laughs> I, I i used to get so mad when you know sometimes she bring us to work with her and he is a six-year-old boy, a six-year-old girl. She running around there talking about Miss Mary Grace and Mr. Johnny, and they walking up to her saying, hey, Lulu, not Miss Malou, you know, not Miss Lula. You know, they call her out of her name, but she had the Mr. and Mrs. Day children how would they survive you tell me you know when you walk down the street a white female will come and if you look at her straight in her face and if she decided she didn't like you looking at her straight in the face and say he whistled or he said something to me and then you lose your life so you are trained when you saw him coming you step off the sidewalk and you hold your head down. It was hard, Jim. But was like it, I said, did it feel like it took your manhood or your personhood away from you? It felt like you it they made you feel less than human. It made you feel less than human. But as I grew older, you know, like I didn't put myself in these positions. So, you know, like it was divided off into white section black sections and like it is now you got everybody all in one block i mean we would have to leave out our area to see a white person just like a white person would have to leave out of their area to see a black person you see and it really <laughs> in so many ways and I say this, I say this with, 
with the utmost kindness till they tried to do something right, but they did something wrong. We had more respect for each other when we was in our own neighborhoods. We had more love and compassion for one another when we was in our own neighborhood. You know, we did not care to wants to drive a, 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 a brand new car. You know, a nice user was satisfactory, you know. But it, it really make you, now that I look back at it, that you had to stand up and be a man, you know. And a lot of them wouldn't have survived because they're gun happy right now. And there would have been a wall. It would have sure been a wall. If this generation here, I'm going to say this, uh, this 90 generation would have been back there in the 50s generation. Uh, it would have been a wall a long time ago. Because their mentality is, you know, kill everything that don't agree with you. You know, they don't know how to take and uh, how you say it. I'm going to duck my head today so I can stand up tomorrow. You know, and, and, and like a lot of times as growing up, man, I felt like, why do they feel like they're superior to me when they still put their pants on one leg at a time, just like me? You know, they ain't no more than me. Do you, do you feel that they thought that they were doing justice. I mean, what did you think? Cause you lived in Louisiana and it was pretty bad there. I mean, yes, it was. It was. And all of that. And it's, I mean, it was bad in the South, but after that doggone um, Loverture took over, took over the French property, then they came in and other folk got it. And it's like, they gonna keep y'all subjected too. And did you get to taste any of that? Oh yeah, like I'm telling you now, I experienced walking the streets. I experienced if I uh, wanted something from a grocery store out of my neighborhood, I had to stand outside the door and look in and wait till the man send somebody over there to see what I want. I'm spending my money, but I can't come in your store. If you had gone in, what would have happened? I don't know. Uh, you, you probably got beat to death. You know? Uh, matter of fact, you ain't going to go in because before you, when they see you, it don't even have to be the owner of the store. It can be another patron and if they're of Caucasian persuasion. When they see you step in the door, hey, 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 boy, what you want? What you want? Hey, boy, what you want? Man, that sounds like a rat coming into a place and folk trying to kill it. <laughs> and that's exactly what it, you made you feel like it was less than human, you know. But uh, like I say, you know, uh, it put a lot of bitterness, a lot of hatred in your heart. And, you know, I ain't going to say I took it with a rose colored spoon because I didn't, because I rebel. I rebel. And I rebel undercover, you know, and late at night, I made those that I caught pay for the injustice. I made them, and what I say made them pay, you know, like they used to ride and catch us at the night and beat the hell out of them. And we used to ride and walk at night and catch them and beat the hell out of them. You know, that was our justice, you know? And it, it, it's, and then we got to a point where the industrialized community had grown and we learned to work with them and you really get to know them. Uh, when you out in those oil fields or out in those fabrication plants, shipyards, whatever you want to call it, when they're working side by side with you, <laughs> then you get the chance to tell them, see, you ain't no more than me after all, mm. you know? And, oh man, what's your, uh, you know, see you man now, because it's five or six of us down in that hole and one white boy, you know? And man, what you talking about? 
I said what I'm talking about. See, you so you think you're so superior when you come up out of this hole. And when you get up there amongst your people, you feel like you're God. But down here in this hole, where it's five of us and one of you, it's like I'm a man. But when you see me later on, when you out amongst in the supermarket or somewhere, and you pay up my hey boy, how you doing? I say, you know, you know, you ain't no more than me. You ain't no more than me. So you know, but I, it, it, this yeah. is this is one of the things that I want our young people to know, but I want our elderly people that lived it to understand what was going on and to understand that the most high God was trying to get us to turn back to him. How much pressure can you take and see that you have no way out before you turn to him? And when you do turn to him and he does heal us and forgive our sin, when he, when he does hear from heaven and, and heal our land, heal our plight, Will we be willing to rule with righteousness and justice like he said, or will we go try to repeat the same thing and have his hand against us? If we don't learn his ways. If we don't learn his ways, you see it every day, uh, Pastor Tim. Look at some of our politicians of our color. Are they doing anything to help us? No, and the preachers are the ones that, it's the, you wouldn't expect your preacher to be molesting your son or your daughter or your mama or your sister nah, or stealing I, I, or lying or beating or pledging for abortion and saying that I'm going to do this and I want to stay in the Senate or telling people you boys don't have to be boys no more. Your girls don't have to be boys. I mean, girls anymore because I got some money. And if they let me make it, we can say one of us make it and maybe I could be on the wall on one of those days when they have Black History Month. I wish to God there was no such thing as a Black History Month. All history is American history and the American history is going to be full of black. That's it. It's gonna be full of mistreatment. Yes, yes, and it it, and it really full of, lies. full of it, full and of God it, and inherited. you know, uh, I'm gonna make you laugh. Uh, I hope, but anyway, uh, in our parish, we you know we have parish like y'all have counties and stuff here, and Jefferson Parish High, it was eight black deputies. And boy, you can almost swear to God like God had came down and touched us. Oh, we ain't got to worry about them white boys pushing us around, beating us no more. When they put them guns and badges on them Negroes, you wish the white man was coming at you still. Him. Lord have mercy. You understand? Here you think you got somebody gonna help you and they got worship. They got worse than the white folks. That's when I finally realized that I got to stand up for me. I don't care what nobody else does. And I used to tell them all the time, I'm a man just like you, man. I said, you're going to treat me with respect. Uh, uh, we're going to do whatever we need to do. And, and I meant that from the bottom of my heart. That's why right now, you know, like, and I'm not glorifying nothing I did, but it was the way I felt like I had to survive. If you didn't respect me, I didn't respect you. I don't care who you are, black, white, green, police, non-police or whatever. If you didn't respect me, I didn't respect you. And my retaliation was more, far more dangerous than yours. Do you think, yeah. do you think that the time will come that that same ability you had to fight and stand up for yourself can be channeled in a way that you could take the word of God and help defeat these enemies of this kind of thought process, this kind of wickedness, and that we can set a pattern for those that are behind us, that they don't have to recover the ground that we've recovered, but and they see. can move further along so that they can be in a position to lead in this name, world. In the name in of the Lord. In the name of the Lord, this is why I talk. This is why I pray. This is why I try to tell them. 
they don't understand where we come from. You think you got it made, but you ain't got it made. About two years ago, I, I addressed a sixth grade elementary class and uh, I was teaching my grandson some of the chaos and stuff that I grew up through, through black history. And so they had black history week at school and they, by him repeating what I had told him, his teacher asked me to come in and speak to the class. Okay. So in speaking to him, I, I let him know, you know, that uh, they say slavery is don't exist, but what you young people have to identify that it's a new slavery. No, you don't work in the fields. You don't go out and pick cotton or cut cane or pull rice or none of that. I say, but right here in society today, you go out in the workforce, you go to school, you get your BA degree, you apply for a job that uh, they put the job on the open market saying that a BA degree is required. But then uh, Mr. Joe son, who is a Caucasian, only got a high school diploma and don't even know the job, but you done went to school and been trained for the job. But since it's Mr. Joe's son, Mr. Joe's sons get the job over you. So this is the new slavery that you have to be aware of, that they're still in control, they're still give and take, and they take more than they give. Mm -hmm. See, this is why you have to teach these kids today that you have to be better educated smarter, wiser than any other person in this world because of the color of your skin. Anything that you do, you have to be twice as good at it as the Caucasian brother. When the time comes that we get the curse removed off of us by turning back to the most high God nah. and he put his favor back on us, we can look back at these days and just say, you know what? They I tried, but they couldn't win. It took so long, I don't know. But I'm telling you, if we don't make changes, many of us, and I could take most of the people that I know in church right now, they could not be my Bible teacher. No, they don't teach no Bible, man. Uh, quote, unquote, I was in a Bible class earlier. I think three scriptures got read. Three scriptures, uh, not a Bible scenario, but a scenario was given. Then the Bible class turned into a meeting. This way you couldn't lead me. You know, see? If you're going to put your word above the I God, I don't want to have it. But and see, and see, that's the irritating part about it because, and, and like, you know, how you paint yourself. And you said, did I actually all these years sit there and listen to this? You did. And was satisfied with it? Yes, I was. You know, and I thought I was doing the right thing. That's the sick part about it. I thought I was doing the right thing. That's what propaganda does. It, Andrina calls it, Andrina calls it magic, sleight of hand. They use, and that's, they what, that's what the whole thing was. I'm a I'm going to tell you a little bit and what I would like for you to do. And it ain't nothing about serving God. It's about pleasing me. Well, I want everybody to be prepared to go back into this chapter. Let something major happen. And let's work our way through this second chapter. Then it'll start moving faster after that. But if we don't realize this man is telling you who he was so that you, no matter what you look for, no matter what you try to get, you can't, you can't outdo me. It's like run, run as fast as you can. You can't outdo me. I'm the gingerbread man, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so tell everybody, good night, everybody. Good night. I mean, it was a beautiful lesson, though, Pastor. Thank and like you. I say, uh, I don't know, you God send to me because I learned more with you in the last couple of years than I learned in 30, 
40 years that I try to be saved. You the know, Lord, the Lord, the Lord know who, how to build his person up for the right time for the one that's coming. Yes, I'm yes. And uh, home, everybody. Good night. We love you. Lord. Lord. We yes, love, love you. you. Love y'all, too. Love y'all very much. Like I said, I can't sometime. I can't wait to Tuesdays and said to get here so I can get some real truth. You know? Yes, sir. Did I ever give yeah. you? Did I ever give you the YouTube page if you want to go back? And oh man, my TV set on you. Okay, cause I I got another YouTube page that I don't know if you have that we had long time ago. I, I'll send it to you. Let you see if you've seen well, this page. I I be looking at uh, segments where you don't even have your beard. Now, how long ago that been? Uh, probably two or three years ago. Oh, but wow. that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Did you look you know, at so, I had black hair? Uh, I ain't got that far back yet. You know, nope. I ain't got that far back yet. I, I'm like almost like I think I'm like in the uh, say like a year ago. You know how they say six days ago, eight days ago, and right. twelve months ago, one year ago. Like I'm in the one year ago now. But when you when you when you get the way you can't look at it. I can give you a, a, a link where you can go back almost 20 years ago when we were teaching and not using video, okay? Wow, man. I guess that would be something to listen to, you All know. Right. But like even then, even those, man, it still brings it out because Bible scripture, and I can go right along with you in the Bible, and everything you said two years ago, it still exists in the Bible today. That, that was the goal that the Lord put inside of Andrina and I. We wanted to be teachers for those that preach, those that teach, that didn't have the tools that we have, didn't have the resources that we have, and maybe had gone to a Bible college where the Bible college might not even, I don't even believe in a whole lot of extra accreditation, but sometimes accreditation is good, but sometimes people do their own accreditation and you don't know how to look it up. But if the butt naked word of God is the butt naked word of God, I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care if you can speak every Hebrew word, every Greek word. Context is going to matter. History is going to matter. And don't tell me that Reverend so-and-so because he don't have a degree or this brother so-and-so or -so, a deacon so-and-so, once he get that word in him, you'll find out just like when you was in the hole, the other people wasn't all of that. Well, a lot of time when those people, not in front of those that look up to their title, they ever say, how you know that? Where you learn that? Say, what the Bible say. That's what I'm gonna they ask, ask a question that I was asked tonight. Okay. Do elders, bishop, pastors, deacons, okay, cut it short, just say, do men and women of Talos in the church have more accreditation with God than the lay members? No. Let me tell you what, let me tell you what Sister Andrina was telling. It's not right because she said it, first of all. It ain't wrong because she said it. But when she was <laughs> right and she, <laughs> she a woman that live it, it matters. She was talking about a man from Africa that we used to look at. I got some books because he was very, he would shut down people like that. He would shut down Muslims and different ones making fun of what he believed in the scripture. He says to a man that had a whole, Andrina, tell him about what Ty said, because I'm getting ready to get it wrong when he told this man uh, about him being great and he told him he was a servant. How did he say it? Because I know- can you hear me? Yeah, I can. There, go ahead. Okay, what he was saying is that he was showing him how we, the black people in America, who have been scattered to the four corners, that we are the children of Israel. We are the sons and daughters of Abraham, and 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 the people said, "Well, you saying that you better than us, and and you more than us, and you more blessed than us," and he said. What I'm saying to you is I am your servant and I'm here to serve you because I'm here to be a mediator between you and the Most High and to warn you from him. 
And so the greatest, and this is, and this is not new. It's just, it's not just because he said it. But our Messiah said, the greatest shall be the servant. Yes. He shall be servant. And they said, which one of us going to sit here and do this? And on the right and the left. And, and he talked about benefactors. And, and this is how the world works. But not with you. The greatest among you shall be the servant. And so we don't want to serve. And in, in, in history, history, if you look back at it, all things of any great value to mankind, and I'm speaking on inventions, I'm speaking on high intelligence medicine, I'm speaking on high intelligence uh, machinery, 80% of it was invented and accomplished by black men. Yeah. But nobody wants to believe that we are the greatest. We are the leaders. But they didn't train they, most of them mind to believe that they are only as good to pick up and put down, not to be a leader, not to be a manufacturer, not to, you know. And when I used to read this, I say, wow. And then I, as I got older, I began to understand. If you out there picking cotton all day with your hands and your back so so from bending over, you're gonna try to find a way to get that man cotton up and don't have to be down there on your back. So what you're going to do, you're going to find a way to make it easy for yourself. This is how we become inventors. Because they worked, they worked us so hard that we had to find ways to do things easier, to make life easier for ourselves. And then they would steal our ideas and patent and make millions. Okay? The, black, the first heart transplant was done by a black doctor. By a black doctor. You know, very seldom you hear something about him, but the white man take it as they was the greatest heart surgeons in the world. And but everything that they know, they learn from a black man. This is one of the things that when the most I said we would be a byword and a hiss. <laughs> and we are not treated like anything we are dehumanized actually one day when i go through those curses i'm going to show you the dehumanization process that the most i talked about but as but as of right now whatever they said about the people with the titles the greatest among you is the title is not the title is the one that's the servant and solomon is going to talk about that wow. very thing. see that's uh it's going to be a city that's about to be destroyed and nobody, none of the big wigs can save the city. But a little poor righteous man saved Don't the city. have to be the one. And that's after it. they save the city, they forget about it. <laughs> See, look. And, and that's and what. Servant, and to be the servant doesn't mean to be the servant of man. Normally, I sit and don't say that's anything. And tonight, yes. tonight, tonight, I, I keyed in and I said that. And I say it just like this. I say, well, the lay member and the the bishop, the pastors, the elders, all the title holders, if they are not right with God, and that lay member have a clear servant and clear passion serving God, he is far greater than any of those titles. Yes. And they could nothing but agree. Well, because because that that Catholic teaching was confronted by somebody, and they didn't know what it, whoever it was didn't know what you were getting ready to say. And said, but, if you don't, if you I don't care what kind of title you got, if you ain't got no title, if you ain't serving God fully and truthfully, you ain't gonna be no greater than nobody else because God ain't gonna let you. You're gonna be worse. That's it. And see, that's why you have to sit 
God forgive me. But anyway, you got the almost beg people to come to church. You got to beg people to participate. People tired of being told nothing. Tired of spending their money and waiting on that window to open up with more blessings than I can receive. I'm getting my blessings anyway because I serve God. I don't serve man. You know, and I told a friend of mine today, I said, well, I don't know, but I don't really think Satan would bless a person just to despise God. I don't think Satan will heal a person just to despise God. You know, just to keep a person in a sinful nature, don't let nothing happen to him so he can constantly sin. When Satan catch you not serving God, that's when he pluck you out because he know he got you. Well, he ain't going to let you get a chance to repent. It's going to be like them three little elves. Them three little elves say... I'm going to ask you something, though, about the, the, the most low. That's what I call the Satan. Do you remember one time the, the Bible showed where the individual, he kept getting more and more and more, and God had to pluck him out. I talked about him Saturday. He had all these barns. He built them up, and he going to tear them down and build some more. And God said, I'm going to pluck you off. I let you get fat and happy like a big fat pig. Then he had another <laughs> one where he <laughs> talked about a rich man and Lazarus. The rich man was, had everything that this world would want. Yeah. And he dressed the kill sumptuously every day. But he wouldn't even give Lazarus anything. And so when they when they both died, the rich and the poor, the roles were reversed. But then we look and we see that Satan offered the king eternally mortal, the Christ, everything. Everything if he bow and worship. Look at the gangsters. Look at Pablo Escobar. Look at the people that make so much money they can weigh planes. Look at the people that make and lose billions of dollars a day. So there are some that Satan will allow and God will allow Satan to give a whole lot of stuff. They can do more wicked. They can, they can make more X-rated movies. They can make more movies to make fun of people. They can promote homosexual in the school. They can promote lesbianism. They can promote um, adultery in the school. They can promote going and hooking up, doing shots. They can promote that black people with nothing. They can go and buy the Congo. They can make weapons of war. So th there are some that, that will have that money. Materialistic. To what? Material, materialistic wealth. And that is what people and Satan want. give it to them. It. And this is why they prosper because Satan is making them prosper and making them idols. Yes. Making them idols. Making all the non believers, I'm going to say the non believers because they would run after this. They would give up their soul to drive a Bentley or to live in a 12-room house. And so many of them are doing it. But those that know the word, they are completely satisfied with a two-bedroom house and driving a fold. Because I have the most precious what God gave. I have help and I have a peace of mind. I don't have to wonder who's going to steal from me. I can't sleep because I'm afraid somebody's going to steal some of my materialistic things. See, that's the difference between accomplishing great wealth, but you lose your soul in the process. Satan does that. But when you go to get up and go to work every day and you make what you need and you live comfortable, you go to bed at night, you sleep sound. You ain't up all through the night. You ain't got to take a pill to go to sleep and take a pill to wake up. I'm going to talk about Proverbs 10 and 
22. You know? So, yeah, Satan will give you, give you the tools to be destructive. That's but what, Satan that, ain't going to give you nothing. Right there. Proverbs he ain't going to give you nothing look to at where 22. the blessing of Yahweh, the sweet Yahweh, makes rich. And not an inch of sorrow. And I promise a lot of the stuff that we have in America, a lot of the wealth that we've had in America and those that have gotten the wealth in America, there, there is a much fear that they got the blessing of the Lord, but it wasn't what made them rich. And no. they were afraid that it would add sorrow. And that's why they tightened screws. And the practice was done on locking people down. And we'll get a chance to see what else they do next. Mm -hmm. But you all be prepared, if you will, for Sabbath. I want to go from chapter two. I want to get chapter five. And I'd like to finish the whole chapter so we can move into chapter three of the book of Ecclesiastes. I need you all to continue to keep me in, the pray in your prayers. And let's pray for one another. That Amen. will be the lead that we'll be willing to do God's will no matter what it costs us. So may y'all bless us and keep us. Make the glorious face to shine upon us. Be gracious to us. Bless Elder Lane. Strengthen Elder Lane. Thank you for all the trips you let him make up and down this road and be able to be safe in the hard rains and in the storms. Oh, Lord, yes, Jesus. Our different ones in his family they're still dependent on him when it's the time they could do a reversal. I ask you to look upon my wife and thank you for what you've done for her. And when you allow her to be able to get her breath back, thank you for what you've done for Gary and the hard trials that he went through and you never left him. When the tears were hard and then you allowed him to see joy can come in the morning. Thank you for all that you've done for me, all of the wrecks that I've been in. And you still let me be able to do your will and your way. And thank you for my mom out here for all that she has helped put in me. So that Hold I can on. Be yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I want to tell you all I love you. May the most high bless us. And let's be prepared to go in with Gary on Thursday. I think he's going to yeah. be in the book of Acts trying to squeeze some juice out for us. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. And bless you, Pastor. Bless the whole team.